thank you very much for the opportunity to speak uh, at, at this meeting. Um, I, you know, I get to I get to talk and interact with lots of different audiences and conferences, but this one is kind of unique. Um, it's rare that I get to talk to a group of people who are thinking about a lot of the same problems that we think about all the time. So I'm really looking forward to um, talking with you all more uh, after this, but you know, this will give you at least some introduction to how we're thinking about things and uh, what we've done with Galaxy. Um, and I guess the other thing I'll say is, you know, it's been a, it's been a kind of a privilege to be involved with this institute um, in advisory capacity for a while now through the conceptualization phase um, and on to you know, the, the, the creation of, of all of the great work that's been done here. So um, I, you know, I, really, I really think it's, it's pretty amazing, the community that's being built here. Um, so again, thanks a lot for being able to be part of it. Um, but yeah, today I'm gonna talk about uh, Galaxy a bit. Um, I updated my slides. That's a great thing. I, you can actually edit your slides on your phone while you're listening to the beginning of the meeting. Um, I, I really enjoy the modern world. All right, so here's the agenda. Um, we're gonna talk about some science, we're gonna talk about some gateways, and then we're gonna talk about some community. I think this is probably appropriate for, for this venue. Um, so let's start with some science. So back in the early 2000s, we uh, were thinking a lot about comparative genomics. So the human genome uh, was sequenced in about 2001. Uh, well, the initial sequence, we're still finishing it to this day, but um, the, the, this was the, the first like large mammalian genome that was available. And of course, you know, we're, we're rather interested in understanding what's going on with humans. We think they're, they're kind of special, of special importance to us. Um, and so the next stage was thinking about how to, how to sequence some of these uh, model organisms that are you know, other mammals that are relatively related to humans. And so in 2002, the initial sequence of the mouse genome uh, came out. In 2004, the initial sequence of the rat genome came out. And at Penn State, we were all involved in, in, in these projects. And so our story uh, for today begins somewhere around here uh, when we were thinking about how to bring in this, this third um, mammalian genome that, and, and, and use it to try and understand human biology. So why? Why do we care about comparative genomics at all? Well, um, first, we uh, were able to make this, um, this wonderful figure, which is probably the worst um, abuse of the Venn diagram that I've ever seen in my entire life, but uh, it, it made for a very uh, cool t-shirt. But more importantly, we can use comparative genomics to understand parts of the genome that were hard to access with just the human genome sequence alone. So here's your, here's your science, here's the, the most biology I'm gonna give you for today. Um, but what this is showing is uh, a cartoon of uh, some, some chromatin. And so we have different kinds of elements. And so this is a promoter region, which is where, the, where transcription starts. These are the genes, right? Um, and so, uh, you know, we, we have polymerase and such, which creates RNA, which gets turned into protein, which does all of the important stuff um, that, that cells do. Um, and so these, these regions, the, the regions that actually code for protein, are actually only about 1.5% of the human genome. The human genome is big, function is actually quite rare, as far as we can tell. And the thing about this is they're actually quite conserved across evolution, and so you can, um, at very, very long distances actually do comparisons like out to fish and things like that to find uh, these elements. So these elements turn out not to be the hardest thing to find. But in mammalian genomes, there are also all of these elements that we call cis-regulatory modules or regulatory regions that control when and where these genes are being expressed. And they um, could be very far away from their genes they make up a significantly larger portion of the genome, five to 10, maybe 12, maybe 20, depending on who you believe. Um, and the thing is, they're much, much less conserved and they're, they're much harder to find. But at the right evolutionary distance, you can potentially identify these elements. And so this is a paper going all the way back to 1997 
that Ross, uh, Ross Hardison and Bud Miller wrote, suggesting that you can use the alignments of human and mouse to identify these regions. And so what this is showing you is the beta globin gene cluster. These down here are the actual genes in black, but upstream you have this, uh, what's called a locus control region, a bunch of these regulatory modules all in one place. And this plot is showing alignments and their percent identity, so the percentage similarity between human and mouse. And you get these clusters of alignment where you have regulatory elements. And so this is really the motivation for this whole thing. This was the, the problem we were thinking about when we uh, started thinking about galaxy. Um, the fundamental idea is that over evolutionary time, functional regions are going to stay more similar. Non-functional regions are going to become more diverged as time passes. And so it gives you a way to focus in on these regions. So the, the, the thesis then is that whole genome alignment can help us to understand biological function in the human genome, or alternatively, the big question we were trying to ask in the early 2000s is what is aligned to what and does it overlap with anything interesting? And in particular, can we see specific signals in an alignment? Can we actually, can we do even machine learning types of approaches and ask, um, do we see information in these alignments that could tell us whether something is a gene, a coding region versus a regulatory element? And the thing is, answering these questions absolutely requires computational approaches, right? The moment you go to the whole genome, the moment you start trying to think about these patterns, you can no longer do this stuff in, you know, by looking at pictures or by using Excel. We really need, and so our biological collaborators who want to understand gene regulation become dependent on computational methods very quickly. So the real fundamental question was, can we make it easier and more efficient for experimentalists, this is Ross, and computational researchers, this is Webb, to collaborate? Um, can we eliminate a lot of the back and forth that goes into um, taking the knowledge that, you know, an experimental researcher who spent a long time studying a particular regulatory system or other, other biology, any kind of biology really, to collaborate with someone developing computational tools, data analysis tools. So at the very beginning, the, as I said, the first question is what overlaps with what? Is what aligns? Is it overlapping with anything interesting? And so Gala, you might, you might start to see where we're going here, was a database for um, alignments and annotations. So basically, can we, we, we do these alignments between the human and mouse genome, we take all the annotations that are known, we put them in one big SQL database and give people the ability to start doing queries on that, right? And so um, arguably this was our kind of first science gateway, it only had the ability to do these kinds of um, these, these overlaps, but you could start to ask, okay, can I focus, if I'm interested in a particular gene or whatever, I can focus on a region of the genome, I can look at different classes of elements that have been annotated and overlap them. And one of the nice features here is that um, when you used Gala, you actually, uh, every time you did one of these queries, we stored that query and kept it forever, and so you could start to build up on um, combining these things. And importantly, all of your previous work was stored. Um, and so this gives us our first inkling of what in Galaxy uh, we call the history. So very quickly though, we realized that just being able to do these overlaps, alignments, whatever, was not nearly enough. In the comparative genomics and bioinformatics space, tons and tons of analysis tools are being developed. Uh, very, very quickly. And so we wanted to make it as easy as possible for our computational colleagues to integrate those tools into this science gateway so that the biologists could actually use them. And so that's where Galaxy was born. Um, and so, you know, the core idea, so we still have these queries, we still have the set operations and things that um, came from Gala, but we proposed to be able to start to introduce analysis tools, things like estimating neutral evolution, the rate, the rate at which um, the, the genome is evolving when it's non-functional, estimating different properties that allow you to look for negative and positive selection, other, other uh, evolutionary features, um, and so on. 
And so we, the, the, the crucial thing that made sense at this time was, and actually we didn't go down this road right away. Well, we started by actually implementing these methods inside Galaxy. We're like, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna write new tools that do certain things. And that turned out to be fundamentally unscalable. And so the, um, the next thing we did, which is really what Galaxy is at its heart, was the idea of being able to take existing tools and with a minimum of effort, integrate them into this framework. And so this, was, this is a very early Galaxy. Here's our tool config all, showing all the different tools and here they were available in the nascent Galaxy UI. And here's an example of one of those tools. And so the fundamental idea, right, was that if we take a command line tool, we specify inputs and outputs in a, in a uh, kind of flexible way. And then this allows us to generate the web user interface and then um, for a given set of parameter values, actually create the command line, send that out to whatever kind of computational resource and so on. Um, and so this is a very, very early uh, Galaxy config. All right, so that's Galaxy. That's it. I mean, that's the fundamental idea. We built a lot of stuff on top of this, but uh, 2006 was pretty much, um, this, this is Galaxy in 2006. We've got our tools over here. We've got our analysis history. This is where every analysis, everything you do is stored um, forever so that you can always go back and see what was done. And then our generated web UI. So the cluster tool in this case, um, we build this UI and as I said, the user fills in their what they want to do, we validate it, we create a command line, we send it out to a cluster. Cool. All right, so this was great um, for working with genomic intervals and doing overlaps and things. But then everything changed again. Um, so this is an Illumina NovaSeq 6000. This is a DNA sequencer. And it can produce 20 billion 300 base pair DNA fragments per one, per run, that's about six terabytes of data. And this machine can produce that every two days. So we really had a fundamental shift in the availability of data production in biology. That's just one instrument. Um, so scaling that down, this is a, this is a NextSeq, another Illumina instrument a MySeq, and then all the way down to this relatively new thing called the iSeq, which actually uses um, a, a new CMOS technology to do sequencing. Um, you know, this guy's like, this is like actual size um, versus this is like refrigerator size. So I'll give you some idea of um, how things are changing. And then other technologies. So this is a PacBio SQL. This is a unique technology in that it can sequence very long single molecules of DNA. No previous technology could sequence single molecules. And then the nanopore technology from Oxford, another single molecule sequencing technology, these can produce very long reads. So I mentioned this produces 300 base pair reads. These can produce 300,000 kind of base pair reads um, uh, and, and increasing. And so our ability to produce um, DNA sequence is, um, has been transformed incredibly. Uh, previously, sequencers were limited to these large sequencing centers. Now they are everywhere. These are very accessible instruments. Anyone can do DNA sequencing. It's practically free. Um, the, the instrument cost is, is high, but some of these new instruments, you're talking $50,000 for one of these small scale things. For the nanopore, you're talking a couple thousand dollars. So, and, and nearly every aspect of biology can, be, can, can, be, can use sequencing. We can understand all sorts of different aspects of genome biology, uh, organismal biology, all kinds of stuff by turning experiments that have been around for a long time, but turning them into sequencing assays and making them genome wide and scaling them up. But then for every single one of those, we're now talking about terascale data analysis for each individual um, experiment. So what are we gonna do? Well, um, yeah, okay, so I will restate the problem. Um, biology has been completely transformed into a, a, a data intensive discipline. So large scale um, sequencing, but also things like uh, imaging. So high throughput imaging is um, completely transforming things again with things like the, you know, live imaging on these lattice light sheet microscopes that can produce terabytes of data in 30 seconds, right? It's just absolutely crazy amounts of data production going on right now. Um, experiments themselves are much higher complexity. 
And this has created a real problem for us. Um, so this is a data pipeline that is inspired by some, a, a publication from my colleagues, Jeff Leake and Roger Pang in Nature. And the key idea here is that when we do experiments, we're collecting data at extremely high, large scale. And so most data analysis involves a lot of data cleaning that's reducing this data substantially, a lot of data tidying that's reducing this data even more substantially to the point where we get these summarized data that we make our inference on. And so these summary statistics and results, that's all we traditionally have known how to report, right? Our traditional publication process is all about these things. But when you start working with data at just this um, enormous scale, you're making so many critical decisions at these early stages that completely uh, have the potential to completely change the results that you get. But there's no, there, the, traditionally, there's no really good way to capture this stuff. And so we saw Galaxy as being able to address some of these problems because of this um, emphasis on provenance, this um, emphasis on um, flexibility, the focus on everything being plugins made it very easy to bring in new tools. The fact that we don't rely on relational databases heavily made it easy to bring in large data. Um, and so we saw Galaxy as having the potential to address uh, several concerns. Accessibility, so this I think for anyone who's working in the gateway space, this is a core idea, right? We're trying to take complex computational stuff and make it easy for people to use. That's what the gateway fundamentally is. We were also though very concerned about transparency. This ability to actually do a better job of communicating all the stuff that's happening early in data analysis that's not part of the publication process. And then reproducibility, actually capturing this and allowing people to um, be able to verify what someone else did. I still believe that reproducibility is absolutely fundamental to the, the scientific process. You can't, um, you can't have good science without um, reproducibility. And in the computational space, we fortunately can achieve it. We have much more control over things than in um, the experimental world. And so um, this is a kind of minimum standard. All right, so back to Galaxy. Our modern Galaxy looks something like this, usegalaxy.org, looks pretty similar. Tools, we got the history and so on. So as before, describe analysis tool behavior abstractly, analysis environment automatically generated, tracks all details. In around 2008, we built, added this workflow system because once we started working with data at, this, at the scale of, um, you know, the, these hypervert sequencing experiments, people needed to build much more complex analyses, um, bringing, things to, bringing together a lot of different tools, and so that's something Galaxy facilitates and sort of has, has become Galaxy's image as a workflow system, although um, that's, that's kind of a later development. And then we have a real focus on not just this and this, the actual execution, but in how you share and document analysis. And so, um, a while ago, we introduced this concept of Galaxy Pages, where you can build analysis, build documentation of your analysis, where you integrate the steps right into that. We have, um, we have some new developments in this space, actually. We've been working a lot lately um, on connecting generated documents to workflows so that you can actually build, it from the output of a workflow, a um, automatically build a complete um, description and report sort of on that output. And so, we're still, you know, very, I think that this sharing and publication is a really crucial part of um, achieving transparency. Um, and then, you know, it's a modern web world. We have the ability to do things we couldn't do in 2006. And so uh, we've taken the idea of command line tools being generalizable and, and move that into visualizations. And so you can plug lots of different visualizations into this, into the framework um, and then uh, things like uh, interactive environments. Uh, so this is actually running a Jupyter Notebook inside of Galaxy, but this is an abstract interface you can plug in. Other types of interactivity, this was supposed to be animated, but that's sad. This is actually a single cell RNA-seq analysis um, being done inside Galaxy. Ooh, calm down. 
right, so I'm not going to talk much more about Galaxy itself. Um, we're happy to happy to talk more about it. But in terms of what you could, you know, how you can get it, this is a free for everyone web service, Science Gateway, which I'll talk about a bit more. Open source software, anyone can take this, do whatever they want with it, deploy it themselves. And important to the community aspect, it's kind of become an open and extensible platform for sharing tools and data types and workflows. All right, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about usegalaxy.org. This is a free science gateway for the genomic research community. We provided this since the very beginning. So when we stood up our first commits in Galaxy, we put this thing up publicly at um, g2.bx.psu.edu back in the day. And fortunately, no one knew about it. Um, and also, the data wasn't that big anyway. So these alignments, you could still deal with. It was OK. We weren't going to die. Um, and then the demand for these tools turned out to be way more than we anticipated. right? And we, we thought we were doing something that was important. But there was way more demand for it. Like, biologists really want to do this stuff. And they, they needed, uh, they wanted, they craved an environment where they could do it themselves and get their you know, get the computational, the, the bioinformatics people out of the way. Um, and so there was huge demand. We didn't have, we didn't have any funding. Um, you know, we started this without funding for years. Um, and so for years, we ran this thing largely on surplus hardware. Um, a lot of stuff that was decommissioned by the, um, the computing center at Penn State that we moved over and, and um, tested and threw away a bunch of it and then ran Galaxy off of the rest. Um, we borrowed some storage we, we, from, from various groups all over campus. Really, we were running this thing on whatever we could find. Um, yeah, so turns out that, so I, I, I do want to say, this is really hard. I, and we have one of the best sysadmins I've ever met in my entire life, uh, Nate Karar, who has run this thing almost entirely on his own for a very long time. And, you know, just, just doing amazing stuff. But... We still have challenges that are, you know, th things that are beyond our control. Uh, so this was our server room in Wardick Lab on the Penn State campus. Um, Anton, Nate, and I were all in France when this happened. Um, and so the ceiling failed and water started to flood into the server room. And these, we had like six racks in there, but the Galaxy racks were right here, right under the drip. And that's all of the data. Um, so, this was, this was a very scary day um, for, for someone who's actually supposed to be providing provenance um, to be guaranteeing that you're, um, you're going to be able to reproduce your analysis. I, yeah, not good. So community, right? So uh, we reached out to um, friends at TAC, friends at PSC, and this is when we first really started to engage the cyber infrastructure community more broadly. Um, and so we, um, with, with a lot of support from these groups, were able to uh, migrate, while live, migrate Galaxy Main um, out to exceed resources. So Galaxy Main now runs on resources at TAC, also at IU, also at PSC, um, and uh, so on. So, Going from what it was previously, we can talk about Galaxy now as a nationally distributed service, which we call the Galaxy Exceed Gateway. Um, these are a year old stats, so um, this, this is almost three now, three petabytes of user data, um, you know, 20 million jobs, um, and so on. So you know, pretty heavily used resource, as I said, uh, running by basically taking advantage of resources all across the country. Um, so, Thank you to all these people. I know like all of you are here. So um, thanks, for, thanks for keeping Galaxy alive. Um, this is what it looks like. It's sort of nuts. Um, so we have uh, some virtual machines attacks and bare metal, a bunch of Jetstream. Uh, we, we are, we're heavy users of Jetstream and we've made Jetstream available to you know, tens of thousands of uh, biological researchers. Um, a real fundamental piece of this is something called uh, CVMFS, um, which is here. This is our CVMFS Stratum Zero, which we use to replicate tools and data out across uh, the entire country. Uh, and so all of these, all of these components mount uh, the CVMFS, but there's all kinds of other things going on here, including Pulsar, which is a tool 
uh, developed by John Chilton in um, our team to do these sort of um, distributed heterog heterogeneous uh, scheduling things. Um, this, this was absolutely wonderful because not only can we, were we able to have a more stable, managed, and um, uh, scalable galaxy, we could actually do different kinds of jobs that we couldn't do before because of all the, the types of resources that are provided in this interface. And so this is around when we move to exceed, and you can see this increase in the number of completed jobs, but also the types of jobs we were able to run from these, these jobs that are very interactive and need fast turnaround to things that are, um, are much longer multi-core jobs, high memory jobs, you know, genomic analysis is all over the place, right? Different kinds, you know, if you're doing assembly, you need crazy amounts of memory. If you're doing mapping, you need crazy amounts of cores and not that much memory. And you'll do both of those things in one workflow. So being able to leverage these different resources really helps to uh, handle these kind of genomics workflows. All right, so I'm gonna come back to the Galaxy Gateway a little bit, but that's, that's kind of where it stands right now. But I wanted to then, okay, so we had our science, we had our gateways, and now we're gonna have our community. Um, so let's talk a bit about growing community. Um, okay, so one of the smartest things I think we did uh, was to, start having these conferences very early. And so the very first thing, this is 2010. This was the first Galaxy developer conference. This is at Cold Spring Harbor. Um, so, um, and you know, we invited, we, we did this right after Genome Informatics, which is a big meeting of people who do tool development for genomics. So, and we did it at Cold Spring Harbor where the meeting was. And so a whole bunch of people stuck around, um, very convenient. Um, and so, we started to engage developers, folks who wanted to extend Galaxy fairly early. Since then, um, you know, especially uh, due to the influence of uh, Dave Clements, who's here, um, we shifted this into this Galaxy Community Conference, which we've been running uh, for a number of years. And this is really actually quite important. And you know, I think this group gets it because we have a meeting like this. But getting like-minded people together to actually talk and work together is absolutely important and was huge for Galaxy because um, I think it's one of the things that holds our community together is that people actually come together every couple of years. You know, we have this hackathon that originally was two days and how it was extended to four days because people want to spend so much time together in an unstructured form. Um, so it's really crucial. But there's a few other things we did over the life of the project I think are worth talking about. Um, so, you know, fundamental to Galaxy's success is that it makes it easy to integrate new tools, right? That, that's really the core of Galaxy. Like I said, that 2006 Galaxy where you could write a config file for your tool and now someone can use it. Everything else is just sugar on top of that, right? So the, what we needed was an easy way for people to share their tools. And the Galaxy tool shed, which I think we uh, rolled out in 2011, accomplishes that because the idea is that all these galaxies, you know, whether it be usegalaxy.org, the main gateway, or galaxy instances people are running locally or on um, public cloud and so on, they can all share tools through the tool shed, which provides versioning, provides um, easy, you know, ways to, to manage those tools. But, so you can see it just as a way to synchronize all of these different galaxy instances. But the problem is, new tools are coming along much faster than we can integrate them. Um, you know, bioinformatics is a crazy fast field because technologies are changing all the time. And so tools are being, new tools are being developed all the time. And we needed help. There's no way we could do this. We recognize there's no way we could keep up with this if we tried to do it ourselves. If there's gonna scale at all, we need help. And so we created, we seeded, the Intergalactic Utilities Commission, um, the IUC. And what we actually did is we scraped together a little money and we invited these people to the conference, right? This is 20, so we, I think this was the second year of the first community conference and we paid their registration. I mean, that was all we could really do, but these people came and they, and the ones you see here say founding members, uh, those, are, those are the original um, 
people who joined the IUC. And they were given a mandate, which was, we want you to be the owners of the Galaxy tools. We want you to be the ones who say, these are high quality, these are things you should use, these are not, and, and main, maintain this. And we turned it all over, right? And so this group, group from the beginning became completely self-governing. We seeded it, but since then they add and remove their members on their own, they set their own policies, and uh, we get out of the way. This accomplishes two things. Um, they own it. Ownership is crucial, right? Uh, if you want to build a community, the community has to own what they're actually doing. Um, and it also is scalable. We are no longer um, a point of failure or point of contention. Um, and so they maintain high quality Galaxy tools. They uh, created essentially Galaxy tool development best practices because you know we were just scrambling to get stuff done. We didn't have any best practices. The community developed the best practices. Um, and then they provide support. Um, and so the IUC is still extremely active. They've been adding and removing, uh, or mostly adding members who, who participate in this process. So that was really the first glimmer of um, community is going to be the way that this project actually survives. So IUC made Galaxy tool development vastly more sustainable. The question is, okay, what about the Galaxy Core? It's getting bigger, it's getting more complicated, we need to do uh, much more. Can we achieve the same thing for the Galaxy Core? And so in 2015, we made what was a very pretty, what felt like a pretty significant change at the time, which is we created a formal contribution process. We established a governance policy, which you can find in contributing.md in the Galaxy repository. We established the committers group who were experienced Galaxy developers, and we turned everything over. We turned over the responsibility of managing contributions, adding additional committers, the whole governance. We gave up control. This was super scary. Um, but we, so we, my vote is no more important than anybody else's vote, right? The PIs no longer have any particular strength. The labs that are originally the developers no longer have more of a say than anyone else. But it's all about ownership. So by doing this, we've created a true community project where the community contributors have just as much ownership as the original creators, as the folks who have originally been funded to do this work. And so this is the current committers group. Um, it's a little heavy historically on people from Penn State and Hopkins and so on, but um, we have you know, a, a, a large number of um, committers from outside. We've continued to add um, over the last four years. And just having that, if you, if you look at the graphs, has really increased the amount of outside contribution to the project because people know that the governance is now community-based. Even if they're not a member of the committers group themselves, they know that the, the project is community. And so Galaxy has, at this point, had 573 distinct contributors to the core code. Okay, cool. Tools, core code. What about training? Can we scale that out? So um, I think Dave initiated this, but it became very much a community uh, project, which is the Galaxy Training Network. We started with a training directory, and so these are um, groups all over the world who have registered themselves, have opted in to say, we do Galaxy training. You wanna to talk to us? You want, you want Galaxy training? You wanna use Galaxy? You wanna deploy Galaxy in your site? Talk to us. And so we've been curating this, um, this uh, directory of Galaxy training for a couple of years now. And then one of the really um, key things that's almost entirely driven by community contributions has been this Galaxy training uh, materials. So training.galaxyproject.org, there's all, uh, in different areas, there's all these different training materials that have been developed. And they're almost entirely based on community contributions. 139 contributors to the Galaxy training materials. I think I got them all in here. Um, so, you know, really, really a, a community effort here. Um, I wanted to say more on this. So I, I should include, I should have had more slides here, but for each of these areas, there are different, um, different specific problems that we are training on. And for those, we have slides for some, we have videos for some, we have text documents for some, all of which can be 
adjusted, remixed, used to develop other courses, contributed back. It's almost entirely text-based, so it can be easily extended. Um, and so this has really made it easy for people to both contribute to the Galaxy training materials, but take them and actually adapt them and use them in a bunch of different settings, whether it be workshops, whether it be um, a semester-long course. You can build all of these different kinds of training on top of these materials. Thanks to, again, all of these people who've contributed. All right, so back to the gateway a tiny bit. We've scaled um, tools, we've scaled code, we've scaled the training, but usegalaxy.org is still this single thing, this centralized um, uh, unit that uh, is clearly not scalable. So over the last two years, uh, we've seen the birth of usegalaxy.star, an internationally distributed, um, let's say, loose federation of science gateways. And so this is Galaxy Project, usegalaxy.org, Galaxy Australia, usegalaxy.org.au, Galaxy Europe, um, and usegalaxy.eu. And the idea is we have these, these different galaxies that serve different audiences, but coordinate um, to provide a coherent set of tools, um, workflows, training materials, right? So if you use any of these, your data is still in Europe if you use Galaxy Europe. Your data is still in Australia if you use Galaxy Australia. We're not federating data. I, we can talk about that, but it's, there's a lot of problems with federating data. But what we are doing is coordinating the tools and the workflows. And so I can run something on Galaxy Main. We're not quite here yet, but we're, we're, we're close. I can run something on Galaxy Main. I can take the exact same workflow and run it on Galaxy Europe and get the same result. That's the idea. Um, and we're getting, for a subset of tools, we're there. For all tools, we're getting very close. Again, this all relies on CVMFS, which is an amazing uh, piece of software. And so we, um, we run Stratum Zero out of uh, Penn State, but we replicate that out to um, Jetstream at IU, uh, Jetstream at TAC, but then also out to, um, to Denby, um, out, out the, the Galaxy Europe. The main one is currently running out of Freiburg. Um, and out to um, Australia. Um, so so uh, we can replicate all of the reference data, all of the tools, uh, all of the configurations across all of these sites and keep these Galaxy instances in sync. And the hope is to bring more, right? So these CVMF servers are all public. You can add additional Galaxies to use galaxy.star and um, you know, we're really interested in engaging in uh, the, the rest of the world to uh, build out this network. And so our current, you know, what we're working on is this coherent, as I said, common reference and index data, that's basically done. We are working on um, doing a much better job of how we actually manage that data. And so we have, we start where this is very, very new. The Intergalactic Data Commission is trying to figure out how to, how to manage this in a, a principled way. But then this common set of tools where all galaxies will now have some common set of tools. And if you use those tools, your, your analysis is now portable all across the world is the idea. Um, and so I just want to acknowledge um, uh, the, the galaxy community from within Elixir that's been um, running Use Galaxy EU. Is Fred here or did he go to some e-science thing? Fred? No, so Fred Coppins is around. Um, and then uh, the Galaxy Australia community um, as part of uh, EMBL ABR. Um, and, you know, you too could potentially be part of these Galaxy Australia. All right, I still have a few minutes. Um, I'm going to, that's, that's my science gateways and community. I wanted to talk a little bit about something else very briefly, which is, um, dealing with security, compliance, and privacy, which has become a serious issue for us. So for years, our galaxy has most, you know, there's a rule, don't put human data, don't put protected human data in galaxy. Just don't, right now, please don't. So, but, but the reality is my field, um, genomics, right now, most of the data production that's being done is actually the production of human genome sequences at the scale of soon to be hundreds of thousands, uh, if not millions of human genome sequences. 
most of these are collected from patients, projects like the Centers for Common Disease Genomics, Centers for Mendelian Genomics, um, all of us, a big NIH project, and so on. And these are, these data sets are protected, right? These, these are identifying personal information, not just genomes, but genome adjacent data like health records. So the eMERGE project is a really interesting project right now that's collecting both genome data and health record data from tens of thousands of people. This data is extremely sensitive. Um, but we want, we still want to enable researchers to use this data, and particularly researchers who don't have computational expertise, to be able to use this data to be able to integrate across these genomes to ask questions about human disease um, and, and human biology in general. And so we really have this problem of how we ensure security and detect threats. So we are part of this project called ANVIL from the National Human Genome Research Institute. Um, it's a science gateway, genomic data science analysis, visualization, informatics lab space. Science gateway for genomics, but for protected genomics data. It's fundamentally about changing how genomics researchers have analyzed data in the past. Historically, the model has been we build databases where you download the data from and then you analyze it in your local protected environment. But copying, downloading that data has become prohibitively expensive, right? When we start talking about hundreds of thousands of genomes, you're asking researchers to pay hundreds of thousands of dollars to download this data even to begin to do their analysis. It's difficult to enforce security and compliance. We have incredible redundancy. And so the goal here is to build a platform where all of the data exists in that platform and all the analysis can be done inside that platform. Um, and so the key here is to, that it's a resource that is going to be cloud-based, is going to support sharing and computing over large genomic data sets and provide that data access and control. But crucially, it needs to be a collaborative environment for users with limited expertise and sophisticated data, data scientists. So we still need to provide that easy to use interface for our um, you know, less computational users and at the same time support more sophisticated data science. We have to host all of these large high value data sets that are being produced by um, NHGRI and other institutes. And so the fundamental idea here is almost a aggregation of different kinds of gateways. So at the bottom, we have something called Anvil or, or something called Terra, which is a platform being, that's been developed by the Broad Institute. This is a secure, um, compliant in platform that sits on top of Google Cloud right now. And the idea is to integrate different um, gateways into this so that different types of users can use the same underlying data in a common way. And so Galaxy, but also our studio, Jupyter Notebooks, all sitting on top of the same data so that you can move between different environments as you change um, the kind of analysis you're doing. Or you can, um, different users with different types of expertise can use different views of that data, even that analysis, but in the environment that they're most comfortable with. And then this whole thing needs to sit in a FISMA, FedRAMP, um, compliant environment. Um, and this is, this is actually quite hard because much of this is about compliance and auditing. Much of this is about getting a particular NIH institute to agree that your environment actually provides um, the appropriate controls. And so right now, um, this, this is all being implemented on top of uh, the Google Cloud platform. Um, and these environments are um, hosted within there. We're this has given us a big shift in how we think about Galaxy. It was already starting, but you know, so one of the things we've been doing with Galaxy lately is really embracing Kubernetes and um, rebuilding all of the Galaxy deployment functionality to um, be very, be, be Kubernetes and Helm based. The idea that that's going to be the way that you can take Galaxy and deploy it in almost any environment in the future. And so that's, what we're using as our, as our baseline. There's a, a tool called Leonardo within this environment that's able to launch um, these, um, these Kubernetes uh, 
orchestrated sets of containers. And then we can build Galaxy, with, build Galaxy environments on a per user basis within there. And so that's kind of the shift is where we've always had, for a long time we've had these multi-tenant gateways where people log in, they can share data with each other. This is no longer acceptable in this security regime. Unless all of you are going to get all of your gateways audited for FISMA, FedRAMP, which you probably don't want to do. We need to think about how to re-architect these environments so that you can provide isolation at the platform level, security at the platform level, while still ensuring usability. Um, in Galaxy, we're thinking about this by basically providing uh, a proxy in front of everything that, can, that keeps the sort of view that we've had in the past, but actually all users have a completely isolated environment um, that, um, where there's both privileged uh, databases and shared uh, databases so that we can still have a certain amount of sharing, but you know, sharing in this regime is also much, much more difficult be, because you really don't have the authority to share your data anymore, right? There's, you, you have to go through a, a significant process to be able to actually share your own data. And then this isn't just Galaxy. I think crucial to this is the idea that any gateway, any user interface can be deployed in this environment as long as it's containerized. I think it's crucial that we think about this multi-gateway sort of world that um, you know, we've, with Galaxy, we've tried for a long time to be the one gateway that does it all, but you can't, you just, you just can't. And so uh, figuring out standards for interoperating and hosting these environments, I think is gonna be pretty uh, critical. Um, another thing we're thinking a lot about, and another reason we love Kubernetes is can Galaxy, how little can Galaxy touch the data? And so um, we're, one of the things we're re-architecting Galaxy's job execution so that it can deploy these, um, these this, these units of work where the analysis happens without Galaxy itself ever needing to touch the data. Everything is pushed down into a platform and security is being enforced down here. So the Galaxy itself never needs to touch the data. The less you can touch the data, the less, you know, any piece that touches the data, you have to deal with compliance. If it doesn't touch the data, then you've avoided yourself a half a million dollar audit, which is nice. All right, so some final thoughts then. Some challenges for what right now, health science gateways, but you're gonna see this in lots of other places. There's lots of data. Um, you know, we are collecting data like crazy, and more of that data is gonna be recognized as identifying information as time goes on. And so um, right now, and this is entirely due to policy reasons, right? This is entirely due to how the structure of the institutes work. There's gonna be a, only a small number of analysis platforms where you can uh, get this stuff as motivated by policy, compliance, political questions, and moving data between environments is going to require meeting really substantial compliance requirements. So you don't want to do it if you can avoid it. And so I think making gateway software more modular, more flexible, so that you can actually take that and deploy it in different environments and give people the user interface and move the user interface that they want to the place where this protected data actually is, is gonna be really important. We like Kubernetes a lot as a lowest common denominator, but we need more standardization on how we run these things, how we access data, how we deal with users and all kinds of stuff. And so I'm really thinking a lot more these days about interoperability at the platform, the tool and the workflow level. It would be nice if you could take entire workflows, entire units of execution and move them between uh, these different environments and allow people to use whatever gateway, whatever interface they're comfortable with, um, but with the same underlying data. So that's what I'm thinking about these days. All right, a little bit of acknowledgements. Um, Galaxy community, Galaxy contributors, absolutely amazing. Um, it's, it's their slash our collective project. I don't even wanna say any, like I, in the past, we like, we couldn't do it without you, but it's not even that anymore, right? It's, it's the community's project. Um, but just, you know, we have um, core contributors, about 40 new ones in the last year, tool contributors, again, about 40 new ones, training contributors, so this, um, these continue to go up. Um, you know, we're funded by NSF and NIH largely, but uh, we, our team, but then there are other groups like Elixir, um, like uh, MLABR that have contributed a lot to to the growth of Galaxy. Um, in terms of Galaxy people, 
Um, I'm gonna put these slides on speaker deck. I have way too many acknowledgements to read, so um, check it out. Um, other members of my lab, all of our funding, many collaborators who've been um, really, really supportive. Um, we have our first tablecloth, very exciting time for us. Um, so we have a tablecloth. We've had stickers for a long time. We like stick, I like stickers. Um, but we have our first tablecloth. This is Mo, um, this is Dave. They are right back there and they would love to talk to you about Galaxy, as would I. Um, so, you know, find us and we'll talk more about Galaxy. I'll also just mention, I talked a tiny bit about Anvil. This is a huge project uh, led by us and uh, Anthony at the Broad Institute and a lot of other uh, PIs from around the world. And that is all. And I think I might have some time for questions. Thank you. All right. Yeah, thanks. We, we could take, uh, we have enough time for just a couple of questions, if there's any in the audience. I can always rely on you to have a question. That's great. Thanks. Oh, that was really very interesting to see how your project, sort of the whole life cycle and how it's moving forward. Um, my question was, you talked a little bit about the funding and you have a lot of grant funding. Do you have other funding models that you guys are also have used or pursued? Um, maybe commercial fundings or um, foundational fundings and things like that? Yeah, so um, we've, for the longest time, we've mostly focused on grant funding. Um, so as I mentioned, we originally for a couple of years weren't funded. We first got funding from NSF, which was super helpful in getting the project started. And then NIH, um, and we moved into this, what's called Community Resource Projects for Genomics. It's a U41, soon to be U24 mechanism that funds big projects that are useful to a large portion of the NIH community. So that's been very good to us. Um, and so we haven't had to diversify that much, but of course, all of our hardware, you know, all, everything that supports Galaxy Main is coming through Exceed. So in some sense, that's an alternative funding mechanism for us because that's, there is a lot of funding there. It doesn't go directly to us, but we, we provide it through Galaxy to the community. But to commercial funding, we um, haven't had any up until, we haven't had any. We very recently have started thinking about um, commercial use of Galaxy as a sustainability plan we received an STTR, which is a um, technology transfer type of grant from the NIH um, just a few weeks ago, with the idea of um, providing a, ga a parallel Galaxy service, like the Gateway, but for uh, commercial use. And so that's something we're exploring as a sustainability uh, idea. Uh, I think it is, it is very important. I'm very, very happy to have received so much support from the US government in terms of research, but I also recognize that the sustainability of that is always unclear. We have no idea how long this enterprise can last at this scale. Um, and so I do think that um, offering a commercial service is a, a good sustainability plan. Being Galaxy, of course, it's an open source company. Uh, you know, we wanna keep everything open source, but uh, we're exploring it. Any other questions? Thanks, James. Great talk, and thanks for drawing us upside down as we spend most of our time <laughs> on our heads. Um, I, <laughs> so I have a question about um, the data models, and we're seeing this in, in gateways that do imaging data, is that the problem is a lot of these services think they own the data model completely, and then uh, and you get, got to this near the end there, that actually what you want to do is have collections that you expose to these. Uh, well, that's our view of it. You want to expose them to different services. Um, are, there, are there standards emerging though that, because we've done hack, we've got hacks in there for that at the moment, mm -hmm. um, but we can't keep hacking that forever. So how do I expose my data in a neutral way? Yeah, I mean, in our, in our world, so there are standards emerging. There's something called the Global Alliance for Genomic Health that is standardizing like file formats for particular types of data. So at the lowest level, things like aligned reads, variant calls are gradually getting standardized. Um, above that, you know, it's, 
there are some um, some things that are emerging. Um, we are using uh, for Anvil this data this data warehousing and query system called Gen Three. It's being used by a lot of other projects and um, has a way to represent data models flexibly, convert them to other things. But I think it's still the the standards haven't really quite emerged. Um, you know, one of the things we're thinking a lot about is now clinical data, where um, you have you have a lot of unstructured and and structured, but in various ways, kinds of information that you need to share. Um, so, as part of Anvil, along with other um, NIH projects, we're currently working on trying to figure out what are the right standards for sharing that information, so that you can move it between um, these systems. Um, there's a few different options out there and it hasn't sort of congealed yet. Um, I think it's a good time. I think we're gonna get, we're, we're gonna make some progress in the next year or two in having clear standards, but that's just one field, right? And I think it's, it's really hard to solve generally. Um, yeah, I don't have a great answer. <laughs> All right, thanks. I saw one more question around this vicinity, yeah. Um, Amit Majumdar from San Diego Supercomputer Center. I deal with some neuroscience gateway and hence the question. So um, uh, the initial part of your talk, you know, where we talk, you talked about like you tell users do not upload identified data, right? So is that, that's, that's all you do. You don't have a tools to check every data and, and see if they have any, you know, identified parameters and delete them. So that's one part of the question. And the second part where you did talk about compliant data, if as I assume I'm allowed to upload identified patient data, but then only me and my group who have IRB permission from my institution can process those data, right? No one else cannot. Right. right. So for Galaxy, um, it's a policy. We state, do not do this. Um, it's actually essentially impossible to enforce, right? So there are, um, there are research tools out there that try to identify um, personally identifying information. And, you know, those are things like names and zip codes and that kind of stuff. Genomics is a little harder because all genomic data is identifying and the only way to actually determine is to identify the person. For, right, you get a bunch of reads, we would have to actually do the thing we're legally not allowed to do to determine that that is identifying information. And so uh, we're sort of stuck in that we have to say, just don't, don't upload this data because it's so raw, we can't do a lot with it, but it's, the moment you do the analysis, it becomes identifying, right? So that's, that's a problem. For Anvil, we're addressing this very explicitly. And so within the Anvil environment, there's a, a concept of authorization domains. And so if you have a group of people, say your lab that are authorized to work with a particular set of personal identifying information, you um, you set that you set up that authorization domain. Those people can use it. No one else can use it. This is enforced all the way down at the platform level. Um, so uh, you won't even be able to share that information with anyone else unless they're associated with that same authorization domain. So we are taking it very seriously in that context. It's integrated with uh, systems like dbGaP. Anyone who's in genomics is probably familiar with dbGaP. This is where. Um, private data is um, uploaded at NIH and they, they provide authorization. And so we're integrated tightly with that. So all of those um, dbGaP projects correspond directly to authorization domains. And so if you can apply and use that data. Other people who've applied to use that data, you can share it with, but not anyone else. So, so yeah, we're the, in Galaxy's case, we've always taken the just don't do it philosophy, or if you're going to set up your own Galaxy behind a firewall locally and done. But it's a hard problem, and it's one with Anvil we're taking head on. Any other questions? I think you, I'm, I know you'll be around for the rest of the yeah, time. Absolutely. Yep, so he's cornerable. <laughs> yes, please talk to yeah. me, talk to us. So, we love talking about stuff. So I wanted to thank you, and as part of that, I wanted to give you this little gift um, to you. weigh down your suitcase on your way home. Not, yeah. <laughs> so thank you so much. I would like to give you. a round of applause for. Thanks,